So, good afternoon. My name is David Hargroves. I'm a, a consultant stroke physician within East Kent. There's lots of familiar faces um, here this afternoon, and some of you I've met through some of the stroke engagement work we've done, uh, but also through some of the previous meetings we've, we've looked at um, this reorganisation. So, a few things I'd just like to uh, say to start with. So, um, I've been working in East Kent for the last 10 years as a consultant stroke physician, but also geriatrician, and um, my family live here, um, and my old, uh, older mother lives here as well. My children go to school uh, in Canterbury and, and Ashford here. So um, I'm here and hopefully working here for another 20 or so years. And so I'm completely committed to ensure that the managers and the policy makers uh, get this right. And I think there's a few things that, that are really important. The first thing is I think it's a really exciting time in healthcare. And in the 21 years that I've been uh, a doctor, I don't think there's ever been a better time for us to interlink uh, with you, users, uh, for us health and social care providers to get this right. Because the NHS is a fantastic organisation, the best in the world without uh, any doubt when it comes to healthcare delivery. Um, and of course we pay very little for it. We pay minuscule amount of money for our healthcare. Now, of course, us as providers have nothing to do with uh, uh, the taxation. That's your MPs you, uh, you need to lobby regarding that. We have no control over that. What we are able to do is try and use that money wisely. Um, and so this is a great opportunity, and I really encourage you to engage with us constructively so that we get it right, not just for the small amount of money we do get, but also so it fits your needs. And the more medicine I do, the more I realise that I need to speak less and listen more because um, although I think with years and experience, I know more, in fact, it makes me realize how little I knew when I first graduated and I first became a consultant. So it's a really exciting time for healthcare, and so engage with us, um, and hopefully we do listen, and uh, we will learn from you about what's important for you. So um, I'm going to describe some of the suggestions we have for hospital care. I think the most important thing to say is this current initiative, and let's call it that, regarding the change in health and social care, the most important aspect is not hospitals. I think sometimes we get fixated on where a hospital is and what's in a hospital, but in fact the most important factors is outside the hospital, the social community care, GPs and interlinking with hospital, because the vast majority of your great health continuing going forward is out in the community. And ideally, you should actually never ever come to see me. That would be the ideal, uh, because my great colleagues in community and social care keep you well. However, if you do reach a crisis and you do need to come to hospital, we need to make sure in secondary care, we're equipped to deal with that. But it's really important, the vast majority, of 80% of all consultations and, uh, uh, and interactions is dealt with outside hospital. And that's actually, I think, the great initiative here, not actually what we're doing with regards to secondary care. Having said that, there are a few important changes that we're going to suggest, and it is just a suggestion. Public consultation won't be till next year, but these are our current thinking upon what we've already heard from you, and one of our great challenges, which is workforce. And I think it's really important to acknowledge we haven't trained enough nurses, therapists, and doctors in this country, to meet the needs of our population. Therefore, we have to do things differently if we're gonna deliver for the modern age where we can do so much more. There's so much more we can do. Therefore, we need to change the way we work to deliver ex excellence. So on the screen, there are three key points that I think is relevant to secondary care. The first is we still, in 2017, have the embarrassing reality of inequity of health. So across East Kent, there are still pockets of individuals that have a life expectancy 20 years less than more affluent areas within East Kent. Now that's wrong, and it doesn't matter what your political persuasion is, that's wrong. We need to make sure we have excellence in healthcare for absolutely everyone who lives in this country, and for us, East Kent. It shouldn't be about your postcode. The second thing to say is that we know that lying in a hospital bed is bad for everybody. It's particularly bad for older people who lose muscle at a very rapid rate. Equivalent almost to a year per day of muscle bulk is lost for an older person being in a hospital bed. 
And it's not actually just older individuals. Frailer individuals, regardless of their age, those with chronic disabilities also lose muscle mass at a very fast rate. So we must, wherever possible, deliver excellent healthcare, but then ensure people are back on their feet as soon as possible and rehabilitating as soon as possible, and ideally doing that at home. The third really important point to note is that today, in 2017, we have a problem with our interlinking and relationships with primary and social care. And that's not because of the individuals within the services, that's because of our structures and our artificial barriers. We're not as joined up and cohesive as we should, do, should be. So as a direct result, approximately a third of all of the secondary care beds in East Kent are occupied by patients who say, I'm ready to go home and I'd like to. And as healthcare teams, we say, you're ready to go home and we'd like you to. But there isn't the support in the community yet, or there isn't the additional rehabilitation bed for that individual to go to. Now that's wrong. That's wrong primarily for the patients, but also it's wrong with regards to how we organise care. We know that being in hospital is good if you need to be there, but if you don't, you run the great risk of falling, of picking up an infection, and therefore everyone should spend the least amount of time in hospital that they possibly can. Now that can only happen, however, if we have appropriate resources in the community. So this really is about focusing our attention on great care closest to you at home and alternatives for coming into hospital. Over the last year, 18 months, we've been doing a lot of listening regarding what it is that you would like from the modern NHS within East Kent. So I know this from my stroke work with regards to the reorganisation of stroke, which has been going on for the last two or three years, but also for um, general acute medical surgical admissions. So the five key things that we've heard from you is that you want excellence in healthcare. And you will travel further for that excellence, but you'd like it as close as possible if you can. For example, outpatients. But the overwhelming message regarding travelling was that if you can guarantee me a better outcome, yes, I will travel further. And we know that for, for example, brain surgery, aortic aneurysms, myocardial infarction. We know the outcomes are much, much better if you go to specialist centres. And we've heard from you that you're in agreement with that. And we need to mitigate problems with transport for your relatives and you. But if the outcomes are better, you are prepared to travel further. What we've also heard from you is that you said, please, please try hard for me not to go to the hospital if I don't need to. But if I do, whichever hospital I go to, would you make sure that someone sees me quickly and I don't hang around in A&E for a long time? And can you make sure that the person who sees me actually knows what they're doing regarding my, my case? And it's not a generalist, it's someone who's specifically trained to look after me. And when you've helped me get better, started my recovery journey, and we've decided as a partnership that I'm ready to go home, would you make sure that you get on with it and you actually help me leave hospital quickly and you don't leave me there for a long time waiting for various referrals to be done? They're the things we've heard from you. And I, as a you know, practicing physician, I see this every day uh, and I agree, I concur with you and that's what I would want for my mother and any of my family. So, what are our suggestions and, that, and that's what these are. We're suggesting that we will do everything we can to work with our community colleagues, social care, to avoid you ever coming to hospital by preventing disease, mitigating disease, providing specialists in the community so that you only ever need to come to hospital when you really need to be. And when you come to hospital, we commit to ensuring that you are seen by a specialist that does have knowledge and expertise in your condition. We'll do it quickly. We won't keep you waiting any longer than at all possible. And certainly, we will try and ensure that you don't spend longer in a bed than you actually need to be. And as soon as you're able to and want to, 
we will allow you and facilitate you to go home. We will speed up that discharge process. And the final thing, and I think this is probably, in all my years of being a doctor, this is the thing I've learned the most, is about communication. Talking and listening to you as patients and users and your family about your condition. If I think about the compliments and complaints that I answer, receive, for myself and colleagues, the number one complaint is you didn't talk to me or my relative about what was happening to me or my relative. And we can do that. We can do that. We need to make time to do that. And it, it, it's not because healthcare professionals don't want to communicate. It's because they're squeezed with time. And that's not an excuse. <coughs> that's an explanation. And so great healthcare should incorporate in every consultation the time to communicate with that individual and anyone they choose to be communicated with. So in my own clinical practice, I plan to speak to every single relative of the patient's choice at the bedside on my first consultation. That's what I would want if it was a member of my family. That's the expectation I have, and I think that's the right thing to do. Now that takes time. That can't be rushed. And we need to build a system where secondary care colleagues can do that. They have built in those extra minutes to make that phone call, to have that conversation, so that you understand and you get the chance to ask questions at the point of entry to secondary care. So much of the distress to families could be avoided if we communicated better. We will endeavour to do that in the future. So what's our early thinking about how we can change and how we should change? So to provide specialist care delivered by experts in a timely manner which allows communication at the point of entry means that we're going to have to centralise some of our services. Now that isn't necessarily a bad thing. That's actually a great thing when it comes to outcomes. I mentioned myocardial infarction, aortic aneurysms, stroke. The evidence is really clear that patients do better when it comes to the chance of survival, the chance of going home functionally independent, if the people that are caring for them are caring for that condition solely and they can do it seven days a week. And you don't end up seeing a generalist at the weekends because we're spread too thinly. So the idea being is that we have two acute hospitals that receive emergency admissions one of those will have specialist services attached to it. And by specialist service, we're thinking about myocardial infarction, we're talking about stroke disease. And then we have a centre that is focused on delivering planned elective care. And by that I mean interventions that need to be done in a hospital, operations for example, hip replacements, knee replacements. But we have a single hospital that's designated purely for planned and organised care. Now, why would we want to do that? Well, the evidence is really clear that if you have a hospital that is not constantly put under pressure through flexes with regards to presentation for emergency conditions, they can operate smoothly. So we think about elective orthopaedic centres. You will have a position where that centre is unlikely to cancel operations because they know exactly how many patients they are having that day. They can plan their workforce, and if you know, and if there is a terrible accident on the M20, it doesn't go to that hospital doing elective care. They go to the emergency hospitals, and so that elective centre focuses on delivering planned care. And for any of you who've had either an outpatient appointment cancelled or an operation, and I'm sorry if you have, this can be reduced. I won't say entirely avoided, but can be reduced if we focus planned care on one particular centre. And we know from the evidence from other centres that have done this that not only is the cancellation rate less, so is the infection rate less, so is the duration of stay in hospital less, and most importantly, patient satisfaction is higher. Because you're on a ward with patients with similar conditions, elective planned care, and not emergency sickness. There are our initial thoughts. I'd like to take you through four conditions which um, we think will be particularly affected by the secondary care reorganisation. So, um, neurovascular medicine, stroke disease, my passion. So, 
Fortunately, you live in East Kent and you've got a pretty good stroke service at the moment. Um, it can be better though. There's no doubt it can be better. And that's because even in the last 10 years that I've been here, there are more things we can do that we couldn't do a decade ago. So what we want to do is ensure that wherever you have a neurovascular event, we work very closely with CCAM and you get to the hyperacute stroke center within two hours of you calling for help. Once you're there, you get immediate assessment. And those patients that are amenable to immediate life-saving treatment, get it within minutes. You get onto a stroke unit really quickly. And when you get onto the stroke unit, you stay there for the majority of your time, cared for seven days a week by a multidisciplinary team. That's the ambition. And in fact, we achieve that in probably 70 to 80% of our patients currently. What we don't do is provide the seven day service. And that's what we want to provide because it's right and proper that if you have your event at 7 p.m. on a Friday, you need to see the therapist on a Saturday and a Sunday and the consultant on a Saturday and Sunday like you would do on a Monday. It isn't right that you have to wait till Monday. So we in healthcare have to reorganize how we work. Let me tell you a story. So this is a picture of a gentleman um, his name's not Bill, um, but we'll call him Bill. And at the moment, um, if Bill were to have an event, he would call for help, he would be seen by CCAM very quickly, and he'd be brought to uh, one of our hyperacute stroke units in East Kent, and he'd get his clot-busting drug if he needed it. And again, remember it's only 15, 20% of patients that benefit from it. The vast majority don't. But we try and do it at the moment within an hour. Now why does it take us so long to give this drug? Well it's because we don't have enough staff on 24 hours a day to ensure that we can be as responsive as we'd like. Now I was on last night, work last night, and in fact we did, uh, we were able to treat someone within 15 minutes, uh, but that's not normal. We try and do it within an hour, uh, and it's occasionally that we can do it really quickly. We want to improve that. And now, as I mentioned to you, Bill will go to the stroke unit, but he may not spend all his time there, and he may not get there within four hours. Why is that? That's because we have stroke units spread out over more than one site, and we have beds that aren't occupied by patients who have a stroke, but have got other general medical conditions. And so we've got a mixed patient population within our stroke service and at four in the morning which is when the patient came in last night we might not have had a bed for that individual because someone else was in the bed and we try not to move people at four in the morning so we need to reorganize how we manage our stroke service so we focus on excellence over seven days and there's always a bed available for the patient who needs the right place to go with regards to specialist assessments at the moment Bill will get a swallow screen he will see a speech and language therapist, but he might not see them within hours or a day. He might have to wait till Monday. Now the evidence is quite clear that you do better if you have your assessments earlier. But we want a truly seven day stroke service. So what does the future hold within neurovascular medicine? Well, um, I think it's really, really positive. That's the first thing to say, uh, and I'm gonna ensure that it's positive. Uh, let me reassure you that. What we hope within the future is that Bill will have his clot busting drug if he needs it within 30 minutes. That he will have his specialist assessment seven days a week when he needs it. That he will get to the stroke unit as soon as he gets into hospital and within four hours. And if he needs to stay on the stroke unit for the entirety of his journey in hospital, he will do. Because we'll have the beds available and they won't be used by general medical patients because we don't have the room elsewhere in the hospital. That's our ambition, and that certainly is achievable, but only if we change the way we work. We're looking at uh, emergency care. Um, so you've, we've heard from you that uh, you don't like waiting a long time in A&E, and certainly at the moment you can wait longer than we'd like. What we hope in the future is that we will be able to care for you and assess you by specialists much quicker so that the emergency care is delivered by experts in a timely manner. Again, that can't be delivered over three sites. That needs to be specialised 
into a smaller number of sites if we're going to have the workforce to deliver that seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Let me give you another example of a patient. So again, this isn't Douglas, but it's uh, uh, typical of Douglas. And with my geotrician's hat on, this is someone who I see regularly. So Douglas has had several falls, contacts um, his GP, and is admitted to his local A&E. Now because Douglas isn't over 75, and again we still have this archaic system in East Kent where frailty expertise is chronologically associated with your age, it should be about need, not about your age. So Douglas is seen by a general physician, he's admitted to a general medical ward, doesn't see the multidisciplinary frailty team, and he has his underlying urinary tract infection treated, but he doesn't get rehabilitated straight away, he's not back on his feet, he's fearful of falling, and before long we find he's becoming confused. And he spends a protracted amount of time in hospital through no fault of his own, and not really through any fault of the general medical team. What he needed to do was see an expert team that were familiar with his condition from day one, and it's not based on how old he is. It's about based on how, what his needs are. So what does the future hold? Well, ideally, when an ambulance is called to see Douglas, they immediately alert a frailty team. And the frailty team meets Douglas they meet Douglas at the front door of the emergency hospital and a team of highly specialised therapists and doctors, nurses, assess Douglas. They work out exactly what his underlying medical need is. They prescribe whichever drugs are required and often with frail individuals it's about stopping drugs as well. They have a community assessment and delivery team that are ready to allow Douglas to return home that very day but supported, not on his own but supported. Now, that, this is common practice up and down the country, but not in East Kent. And that's because we're spread wide over three sites. We have three general rotors, three general geriatrics running simultaneously. That means you can't deliver face-to-face -face expert care all the time. Let's take the third example about planned orthopaedic care. Now, I, I alluded to this to start with. So, at the moment in East Kent, there are approximately 250 planned elective knee replacement to hip replacement operations cancelled each year. Now they're not cancelled because we've messed up our timetabling and uh, uh, Dr X is on holiday. They're, they're cancelled because the beds are occupied by people who are sick from emergency admissions. That may well be surgical admissions because they've fallen over and broken their hip or they're medical patients that can't get to a medical ward and therefore outlie onto a surgical ward. Your average wait for replacement <coughs> surgery in East Kent varies between 21 weeks and 28 weeks at the moment. Now, that's unacceptable. Why is it so long? Well, it's so long because we are having our planned elective orthopaedic care on the same wards with trauma, patients who have suffered trauma, emergency admissions, and we're competing for the same beds. And there's one thing that I've also learned in the NHS is we need to stop this competition for beds and resources. We need to plan our care more appropriately and we therefore we have organised care where planned care is somewhere separate. So in the future, let's talk about Mary. So at the moment, um, Mary has lots of joint pain and she goes to see an orthopaedic surgeon who agrees with her that she needs a hip replacement. She goes to a series of assessment clinics, not on the same day, at different times. She continues to suffer increasing pain and increasing use of analgesia. She then gets a date given to her, which may not actually be at her preference. It will be a date that we can find for her. And as I said, it will be 20 to 30 weeks away. The night before she's due to come in for surgery, and of course her daughter will have taken time off work uh, to be with her. The operation is cancelled because the bed's occupied by somebody else. Now, unfortunately, that's a reality. That happens. Not that frequently, but it still happens. And again, that's unacceptable. It's unacceptable for Mary. Um, it's wrong for Mary, and we can do better. So the future is all about planned elective care at the time of initial contact. You have the specialist teams that are able to set a date with Mary and her relative at the time she comes into the appointment. 
the appointment won't be 20 weeks away, it will be a lot shorter, and it will be in a hospital that doesn't compete for emergency beds. So the likelihood is that the date she's given will be the date that she has her operation. We will reduce the likelihood of cancellations, we'll reduce the likelihood of complications of the procedure, and we will improve Mary's satisfaction with our service. So in summary, most of the great news regarding the organisation of care within East Kent is about local care. It's about doing best practice closest to home through coordination between social, primary, community care. There are some changes in hospital care that we want to make so that we can give you excellence when you need it at a pace that is appropriate and not to cancel those elective procedures when we shouldn't do.